Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing great today. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started so we'll be on our way. Um, so today we are here to talk about how to treat and prevent common pests in greenhouse uh, areas. And just a little bit of background about me as well. Um, I graduated from Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina in 2018 with a sustainable agriculture degree. And after that, I went down and worked for Walt Disney World for a while in their hydroponic greenhouses at Epcot at their Living with the Land Pavilion. So that is where my background comes uh, from. And then I also worked for a larger grower in Apopka, Florida for a while as well um, with their ornamentals. So we'll go ahead and get started. But to start off, uh, we'll just discuss some greenhouse management controls, day-to-day um, -day stuff that always needs to be done. Um, so of course is our ICM strategies. This is the base of every greenhouse growing facility that should happen because bugs and insects are inevitable. So we'll need to be able to fight those uh, against any of the bad ones. So integrated pest management, everyone knows is a holistic approach to managing diseases, insects, mites in the greenhouses, and not only by using pesticides, but using different uh, tools, tactics, and strategies to control those pests with the least disruption to your environment. And this greenhouse you see to the left over here, um, this is from the uh, research farm at Appalachian State University. I went and visited them last year, and they had some flea beetle problems, and we'll discuss um, some more insects later on in the uh, webinar. So the, the most important aspect of IPM is the prevention of the epidemics, as many pest management decisions cannot be made in hindsight. So you always want to prepare for that uh, before anything bad gets gets to that point. Um, so as a consequence, most of this fact sheet is uh, fact you'll hear today is devoted to the prevention of the pest problems, such as the maintenance of a healthy crop, uh, exclusion of the pest access to the facility, and we'll get to those mainly about caterpillars later on. Uh, close monitoring of the plant health, so scouting every single day. Uh, just checking to see if there's anything new. And a good way to do this too is using um, the yellow sticky traps. So basically they're just uh, thin yellow sticky cards and you put them on a the little uh, wire stuff the side of your plants and usually bugs will stick to it and you can kind of see what goes in and out of the day um, or if there's anything new coming into your greenhouse. Um, so with that, the most important word with your IT strat strategy is integrated. So that means combining all those strategies once together um, and you can see below, uh, along with pesticides, you have biological controls. So this is your, uh, for example, parasitic wasps and predatory mites, anything that'll help eat the bad bugs for you, um, like ladybugs with uh, aphids as well. Uh, and then sanitation. So if you are pruning your plants or picking out the yellow leaves or after they're shipped off, you always want to sanitize your tools before you move on to the next uh, lot or section or anything like that, because you don't want to pass any diseases or pests along that way. And then the type of media you use too. Uh, so this one that you see in the picture is very basic. It's a uh, raised bed, uh, but some people I know they do, they do container plants on top of racks. Um, so that's one of the most common ways. And depending on what type of media is, it kind of plays into effect too with what bugs they attract. And then another one I really like to press is new plant quarantine. Um, just like if you guys, any of you on a farm, you always try to quarantine those new chickens or anything first before you, put them, you introduce them into the flock. Um, just so they won't bring any new pests or diseases with your healthy plants that are inside of the greenhouse already. And so with that, we'll move on to our pests. And so one of the number ones that are always there um, in greenhouse, any type of condition is aphids. So these are very up close pictures of them. Um, so they're a soft body insect. Uh, they have a needle-like mouth uh, to pierce the surface of leaves, stems, buds, and the roots uh, even too. Um, and they love lush new growth. So they will eat away at that lush new growth by sucking all the nutrients out of the plant, um, kind of like a vampire. Um, so aphids, like I said, are very small, soft body. They have small eyes and they uh, are a piercing sucking insect. Um, they're often green like you see in these pictures, but also may be red, black, or brown. They move really slowly. They don't jump or hop, but adults do sometimes have wings, but they can't really fly. They kind of drift along with the wind. Um, that's the only way they can really move unless they move very slowly. Um, so if you've seen the pictures too, they usually have fairly long antennae. Uh, aphids also, uh, often also have a complicated life cycle. So an adult female can produce daughters without even mating. So what that means is that they, their populations can grow very fast. 
But as the new season progresses, some produce sons and daughters that have wings and, the, and this is what causes them to fly away to other plants and make them spread even more. Um, so then they mate and produce eggs that survive for the winter and hatch the spring, uh, the next coming spring. So the hatchlings may produce without mating. It just, it's crazy how fast they can reproduce in just a short amount of time and even survive through the winter. And also uh, they feed day and night. So there's no off time for them. They are always putting in work. Uh, they are also small and they can drift up high in the sky, not just around. Um, they have found on top of buildings where plants are, especially in cities as well, people like to put plants on top of the buildings um, for uh, like more urban growing. And they even found them all the way up there. It's crazy. Um, and so the juices they drink has a really high sugar content. Um, and aphids have to drink so much sugary juice so they get enough protein so they excrete a lot of sugar. Um, so with that, uh, they can do a lot of honeydew, kind of like the other ones we're going to talk as well. Um, so the sugary uh, excreted is uh, honeydew, like I said, and many other insects feed on that. So what honeydew can end up doing as well is produce sooty mold, um, which is a disease, but it has to be caused by that as first. But um, also, aphids can hide if they detect a predator. So one of their main predators is uh, ladybugs or lady beetles. Um, ladybugs eat them just like uh, they eat the plants. So they kind of suck all the juices out of the aphids and leave their mummified bodies. So that's another way to check out to see if you have um, like parasitic pests in there um, to see if they're doing their job is that you'll find mummified bodies, which is usually probably a light brown color, and you'll see a hole coming out of their back. Um, that's from where the ladybug ate them from the inside out. A little gross, but that's how you know they're doing their job. Um, so whenever they do detect a predator, they can produce a chemical that warns all the other aphids. They're kind of like ants, that they talk through pheromones. Um, they try to walk or fly away, but and then again, they're not really good at that. So it's really easy for some of the um, predatory bugs to eat them. Um, and like I said, even small wasps, spiders take care of them. Uh, and <clears throat> the way they damage, I'll do the next slide. As you see right here, they're usually found underneath, um, so they can kind of hide from the top. Um, so they can call yellow, yellowing of leaves, uh, honeydew, like I said again, leaf curling, and even virus transmission. So since they do that piercing sucking, they're like transferring each plant or leaf they do that from. So it's really easy to spread disease. Um, but with this, um, too, another really easy tactic is uh, just washing the leaves and stems of the sturdy plants, uh, nothing that's, you know, uh, too fragile. The strong water space from the garden hose can help knock them off too and be an easy way to do it as well. And then I'll be going about a couple products that will help treat each of these uh, as well at the end of the uh, webinar. Our next pest is white flies. Um, these are horrible to work with. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows once you start moving around uh, your plants and everything and you see them up underneath your leaves and they're just all in your face, not a good time. So um, they also excrete honeydew uh, from that sugary content they feed on inside of the plants. Um, so these adults are also very small, uh, you see right there, with powdery white wings. Uh, the females lay uh, eggs directly on the undersides of the plant leaf, and even for some of the white flies, they uh, lay their eggs in a circular uh, formation. So that's how you know if you have that type of um, pest inside of your greenhouse, they lay it in a circle. So they, they're eating and laying eggs at the same time and then they're too lazy to do anything else. And so they do it inside of a circle, which is pretty crazy. Um, so again, large populations, these are just more of an annoyance um, whenever they're smaller, uh, but whenever they get to those larger populations, just whenever you see some damage and also just very annoying to work with and you don't really want them all in your face. It's, it's just gross, you don't want that. And then, so some of the best uh, strategy to prevent these problems, uh, like in your garden or greenhouse or anything like that, because these are very common throughout the states as well. Uh, in many situations, natural enemies will provide adequate control to white flies as they are really easy to take care of. Um, but outbreaks often occur when the natural enemies are disrupted by, by insecticides that aren't really good for predatory uh, insects as well. Um, so white fly populations in the early stages can be held down by a diligent program removing infested leaves or hosing down with water sprays, similar to aphids. Um, so good pruning will always be uh, a great tactic to use in your greenhouse to see if you see anything uh, really infested, because usually they always bunch up before they move. Um, that's with a lot of pests like aphids. 
And another great one to use is uh, reflective mulches. Um, this one's great for multiple types of pests too, but especially for white flies. Um, these can repel white flies from vegetable gardens, uh, ornamentals, anything. And then also yellow sticky traps. So since they do fly or the adults fly around like crazy, um, they don't really have that strong of wings. Um, they're really susceptible to just sticking to those pads very easy. And then, uh, like I said before, I'll go over the insecticides that we use to help with that. Um, and then also the general predators for these guys as well are lace wings, uh, big eye bugs, and minute pirate bugs as well. And even lady be uh, beetles and scale predators uh, feed on them. So then we get on to caterpillars. So this was not a huge um, problem in the greenhouse, but I still wanted to mention them because they can cause really bad damage. Um, so this type of worm you see to my left, um, I am located in North Carolina. And this is a tobacco hornworm. Um, so they love uh, high acidic plants or anything high in nitrogen. Um, and unfortunately, my bell pepper plant did not make it. This was after just one night from one worm. And I think the worm was so big that the birds didn't even want to eat it <laughs> because it was outside, under, not underneath anything. Um, so he was very bad. He ate all the leaves and even going after my bell peppers. So with caterpillars, how they kind of get into your greenhouse is through your vents. So that's why I mentioned that they're only problematic really during their summer and fall months. Um, eat all plants far as they can reduce the crop quality and even total loss of crop entirely like you see mine right here. Um, and so how do you want to prevent this? Um, so during the summer fall months, moths can enter the greenhouses through the doors, the vents, and the sidewalls and lay eggs to hatch into the caterpillars and that's how they kind of move about. Um, so these caterpillars always have chewing mouth parts and will feed on a huge variety of plants. Uh, they're left unchecked. Caterpillars like the one you see right here can severely damage a crop. Um, herbaceous plants such as annuals and perennials located outdoors are especially susceptible to an attack. Uh, so the majority of the caterpillars damage plants by eating all the parts including the leaves and flowers. Um, they may eat the entire leaf or even uh, parts of it leaving the mid vein which is you kind of see it in the picture how they kind of eat through the middle of it but not the entire stem. Um, so plants uh, grown inside greenhouses uh, may suffer more damage from caterpillars because there's no natural enemies. So one of their most natural enemies is birds. Um, usually birds will not be seen in greenhouses, uh, especially not because they are also a pest sometimes, especially with fruiting plants. They love to eat all the fruit off of that. But, um, but these natural enemies may provide sufficient control on outdoor crops if you have any of those. So it's important to devise a management strategy that targets both the caterpillars and adults. So Kind of prevent that you can't really close your uh, vents all the time because they'll get way too hot in your greenhouse um so but one thing to do is adults are attracted to light um, especially at nighttime uh moths um so try to make sure there's not a ton of light or that will attract a ton of adults at nighttime and that will kind of lure them into the greenhouse uh unwantingly um so the management of weeds uh both inside and outside greenhouse will also uh, alleviate the problems as well um, we, a lot of weeds serve as hosts for adult females to lay eggs in. So just try to avoid that and keep it down to a minimum. And then also any addition cleaning up plant debris uh, will move uh, the overwintering pupae as well. And then just like I said before, using those yellow sticky cards um, will kind of help catch some of the moths. Because um, again, they're not the best of flyers, they're kind of sporadic. Um, and then also when scouting, uh, always check the plants nearest to the vents, doors, anywhere there's a crack, any, anywhere that they could slide in, always check those plants first before moving into the first or to the ones in the middle. So another option is to simply handpick the caterpillars and toss them outside for the birds to eat. <laughs> okay, on to the next one, we have thrips. Uh, so this is another very common uh, pest inside of the greenhouses. Um, so it also sucks the plant juices from the upper leaf or flowers and cells. So it's all the nutrients. The leaf is kind of like a sandwich. So they have those two mid parts and then inside of that middle, that's where all the good stuff is. That's where all the nutrients lay. So when laying eggs, the females damage the plant. They kind of pierce it and lay it inside there. And then such damage can lead to the def uh, deformation of the plant. And then these also love warm weather. So you see them more in the spring, summer and early fall. Um, and then also if measures are not taken, of course, the thrift population will develop explosively, um, kind of like aphids. Um, so with thrips, <clears throat> most adults, like you see the one on the right, uh, they're elongated, slender, but they're very small as well. 
Um, they have long fringes on the margins of both pairs and have usually narrow wings. Uh, the immatures, or the larvae, or the nymphs uh, are also slender, and but they lack wings. So that's how you can kind of, kind of tell the difference between the two of them. Um, and then you can see on the left, you see this spotted yellowing. So this is from them sucking the plant juices out of it. Um, this can result in the yellowing and then even cause the silver gray and brown dots on your plants as well, depending on what type of thrip uh, that you have. So such damage can lead to deformation, like I said again, if measures are not taking uh, taking effect, thrips will explode. So uh, one of the main pests, I'm not sure where you guys are located, um, but the Western flower thrips, uh, they can double its population in four days, which is crazy. And then, so then also, sorry, uh, so thrips not only damage the leaves, but they can also damage the fruit and shoot of the plant as well. And overall affecting the cosmetic experience, appearance. Uh, so whatever you do, if you sell wholesale for retail, um, that can kind of hurt the sell through. And then also thrifts are difficult to control. So that's why preventative management is necessary um, into an integrated program. And then just following all the other uh, strategies as well. I'm going to the next one. Uh, so then we're going on to mealy bug. So this bug is, not a fun one to mess with. They're just really gross overall. But also they feed on the photosynthate. So it's a fancy word for those sugary plant juices, just like the rest of the ones are. That's where all the nutrients are and that's what's, why they want it so bad. So these are also slow moving, small oval insects that are covered in a white cottony wax. And that wax is why they're kind of hard to control because it kind of, the, the pesticides that are very, you know, easy going or very light doesn't affect them. Um, that's what that wax is there for. And their waste also produces honeydew, which also leads to sooty mold. Um, and then even citrus mealybugs can cause additional problems by injecting a toxin as they feed. So overall, they're just really pain. Um, and these bugs are related to scales. Um, <clears throat> and because uh, of the honeydew, like I said before, it can cause sooty mold, sooty, sooty mold fungi, uh, which isn't harmful to the plant, but it causes the plant to get really dark. It's like an overall dark color not not good for appearance wise um and so some of the best practices non-chemical wise uh, to use for mealybugs is a, just avoidance um all new plant materials should be inspected upon arrival kind of like the plant quarantine you always want to fully check them before you bring in new varieties new plants propagations anything like that um and then just destroy heavily infested greenhouse plants that have them if not possible with a very costly cleanup uh, remove any excess soil or compost piles from the growing area to prevent an alternative uh, infestation site, which is, you always want to keep that separate anyways. Um, and then mealybug destroyers are the parasitic insects that you want. Uh, it can be very effective in controlling mealybug uh, populations in some situations. But of course, we also have um, a product that can help you guys with that as well. Um, but for this technique to be effective, you must be willing to tolerate a low level infestation of both pests and beneficial insects on your plants if you're going to go the uh, more biological way. And then we also have leaf miners. Um, this, they're very easy to look at or very easy to figure out what is hurting your plant because they burrow these tunnels you see inside of here. So leaf miners are the larvae that hurts the plant. So these larvae can come from moss, wasps, flies, beetles, any type. The ones I've uh, specifically worked with usually comes from flies, um, but they lay their eggs inside of the leaf or on top. And then the larvae is either born inside of the leaf or burrows inside of it, and then eats the nutrients in a tunnel formation, which is causing all this craziness you see in the top left. And those larvae are a flat, like their bodies are flat, which is, perfect for them feeding inside. If you see them on the bottom right here too, you can see how many are in there. These were actually a huge problem at Disney. Um, we could not get rid of them. There was just so many. So we, uh, one way to do it is actually just peeling the leaves off uh, and then either tossing it outside for the other bugs or um, uh, small birds to get as well. Um, very easy way to do it, if you just, but that's really uh, labor costing and labor heavy. We don't want that. And so one of the easy ways to do is covering up the plants with row covers to prevent the adults from getting access to the leaves. But if, that, if you don't like that either, um, you just clean up the infested leaves. Like I said, if you are regularly pruning it, just make sure to look out for any of these kind of tunneling look, uh, look like. And then also water your plants. 
because leaf miners do like a more of a drier um, area to go into. So nothing that's wet or really moist, uh, they don't really like that. <clears throat> so these won't harm your plant unless it kills off all of the leaves uh, itself, which has to be a very heavy infestation, but you can see it really hurts the cosmetic appearance of it. Um, and so with that, it doesn't really do good in retail wise. So just uh, have to follow through those three things that I mentioned and it'll kind of help with the population. And so then we go on to fungus gnats. These are also a very uh, bad nuisance pest, kind of like the white fly. So fungus gnats, um, you see they kind of look like a mosquito, um, but they're more slender and then they lay their eggs in the damp organic matter. So your fertilizer, your soil media inside of, or at the bottom of your plant. Um, they can feed on, or the larvae uh, feed on plant roots and damage the plant material from the bottom up. So if you see a bunch of algae or anything growing onto the top of your uh, media, that is huge for them. That is what they want out of a living space for their larva and what they feed off of, especially the female, female flies. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, so the adults you see right here, about an eighth of an inch long, they're really delicate. Um, there is a distinct Y-shaped pattern on their four wings, if you can see it. Um, so, like I said, they primarily feed on fungi, algae, and decaying plant matter. So, it's always good to clean up your prunings as well. Um, so, but the larvae will feed on the plant roots and leave resting on the growing medium surface. So, that's another good way. So, always just keep it clean, um, like I said before, uh, and sanitization, just overall cleaning effects. Um, so larvae will develop rapidly and fully grow in two to three weeks, and then they pupate in or on the gr uh, growing medium, and during their seven to ten day lifespan, females may lay up to 200 eggs into those cracks and crevices of the growing media. So again, they can uh, pretty much repopulate very quickly if there isn't any preventative or treatment put into it. Um, so the moist growing media contains high amounts of peat moss. Um, I don't know what type of mixes you guys use, but peat moss is really popular to use. Um, those are particularly attractive to adult females. Um, adults emerge about one week later, like I said before. Uh, but with these two, with, with most pests that I've been talking about, they're also weak flyers. Um, they fly in short erratic patterns. Um, nuisance problems with fungus gnats tend to be most noticeable during the late fall and winter because um, they like that cool moisture. Uh, so the dry growing medium will decrease survival of any eggs laid or <clears throat> larva that hatch from the eggs as well, kind of lessens their chance to survive. So it's always good to kind of uh, let the growing medium dry between the watering, especially the one, the top one to two inches of that growing media. And then one of the biological controls for the larvae, so inside of the soil media that, that chew on the roots and everything. Um, so one of the biological controls is a uh, nematode. And you can use it as a drench to your growing medium. The insect uh, nematodes are microsco microscopic groundworms that enter fungus gnat larvae through the natural openings such as the mouth and breathing pores. Uh, the nematodes emit a bacterium that digests the internal contents of the larvae. So not a pretty sight, but one way to take care of them. Um, and then the fungus gnat larvae will die within three to four days. And then one of the other most popular pests is spider mites. Um, they're very tiny. So to the naked eye, you won't be able to see them. So which that's kind of hard to suspect them and treat for them. So that's why preventative is always one of the better things. Um, so this also loves dry conditions. Um, a very heavily population will cause that webbing that you see on the top left. And then at the bottom is a very zoomed in picture of a, the two spotted spider mites. This is one of the most common ones um, so plants under any type of water stress are also highly susceptible. So if you see for some reason uh, your watering didn't turn on during the night, always try to check those plants first, just in case anything that could happen, um, just to get ahead of the game. Um, and they like to uh, they like to hide underneath, so you can check the underneath of leaves for their way, their eggs, webbing, and the mites themselves. Um, so the adult females, uh, those are of course the largest forms. Uh, they're one twentieth of an inch long, so that's why they're so tiny. Um, and they always live in colonies. Um, and you always check the under surfaces of the leaves for them. And one single colony may contain hundreds of the individuals as well. Um, and then their, their name, of course, it comes from their spider-like webbing, um, just like you see in the top left. <clears throat> and then, so another easy way to take care of these. Uh, 
is just to keep your plants watered and then also just spraying off your leaves as well. Um, just, and of course, the plants that are you know more sturdy, nothing that's too delicate. And then, like I said before, I'm gonna go over each of these uh, pests again and tell you exactly what we use to treat them ourselves. Um, and then we'll go into there. So this is one of our more popular products to use if you're looking for a more army listed and gentle um, pesticide, insecticide, and miticide. Um, so this is army listed for organic use. So uh, if you guys know, everybody's pushing towards more of the organic army listed type of products just to be more easier on the environment and be more sustainable itself. Um, so with this, if there's no REI or PHI free harvest interval. Um, it's a botanical uh, formulation, and these are three of the main uh, ingredients that you see right here, the linseed oil, rosemary, and thyme. And then so the best way to use the Eco 140 is applying using a sprayer until the foliage is thoroughly wet. Um, so with this, this is great for any soft-bodied insects, um, just like the mites and aphids, any of the ones like that. And then I'll be happy to answer any questions about these specific products as well. And uh, I know we were waiting till the end to uh, any other questions. So, and then on to the next one. And you can see the mixture at the bottom. And then here is Adasol. So this is one of our bigger products that is uh, growing in the industry like crazy because it is a non-oil-based water-soluble neem powder. So whenever you think of neem, you usually think of oil because that's what's been taken from the tree. But uh, Arbojet has been able to put it into a powder form. So why is that better? So one, you don't have to worry about oily residue or you can even use it during the summer. And the reason why you want to stray away from oily products during the summer is because it sticks to the leaves and then it can even cause burning from the uh, direct sun or heat. Um, so you don't have to worry about that with this. And plus it doesn't clog your equipment, which is even better too. So you don't have to be constantly cleaning it every single time you use it uh, if, if you don't want to. And then it works as a systemic and translaminar, so it be absorbed through the trees or leaves, and then it can even be used as a drench. So this is great for those fungus now. Um, and it can even have same day harvest as your food crops. Um, this is also army listed for organic use and, and contains 6% as a direct and uh, offers the highest active ingredient on the market, um, but is a fantastic product. It's, it's an IGR, so it's an insect growth regulator, so it's just perfect for preventative uses. And then we also have a huge support. Um, so I am the horticulture specialist for Arborjet and their and their horticulture sales rep. But we also have tons of researchers, doctors, PhDs, everything in house to help develop these products and work with them. And I'll be happy to send you guys any data that we've had on it so far. Um, if you have a specific pest you're dealing with or a certain problem or disease, um, we are here to help, and we have all these people backing us in our office. And here's my contact information if you guys have any questions. Uh, if you think of anything after the uh, webinar or anything like that, uh, but you're more than welcome to text me, call me, or send me an email to that email right there.